Knowing God through your five senses. What does that mean? This is an interesting topic and something that is somewhat new to me, something I've understood before, but not quite with this much understanding or quite in this way. So you guys are gonna have to bear with me. And this is something that you don't hear every day, okay? So what does it mean to know God through your five senses? First of all, what are your five senses? We got our sight, our smell, our taste, our hearing, and our feelings, right? So those are our five senses. So I have a thesis. I had to create a thesis statement. You guys know what a thesis is? A thesis is the heavens declare the glory of God. And it's this, all of creation, everything that God created is a mirror that reflects God's glory. Therefore, all things that we experience in creation, either directly or indirectly point us to God. So if you have a mirror and you're looking at it, there's a reflection in it. If creation is a mirror, when you look at creation, you see God. It's a reflection of God. Everything in some way, directly or indirectly, is a reflection of God. It points back to him. <clears throat> As the creator, God then is the source of all beauty, comfort, pleasure, goodness, truth, and even trials. Each of these gives us glimpses into the character of God, glimpses into heaven itself. So when we see things, when we experience things in the world, when we see beauty, when we feel comfort, when we feel pleasure, when we see goodness or truth, or even go through a trial, it in some way directly or indirectly points us back to God and helps us understand him in a deeper way. Okay? But we must look at our experiences through the lens of scripture, for through them we come to know God more fully, not just with our minds, but with our five senses. Okay? So, so that's, that's important, important because, because without, without the scripture, scripture guiding us about how to think about his creation, how to think about all things in the world, we can get off some, into some pretty crazy tangents. So we so got to be careful. careful. We got to let scripture guide us. So let me go on about why I believe creation is a mirror. Creation is a mirror that reflects God. In other words, when we look at creation, we see a reflection of God. So if you guys would turn with me, to Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare. They're speaking. When you look at the heavens, they are declaring something. They're speaking what? The glory of God. They're proclaiming him. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In them, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. So imagine this, you're walking along a beach. You have probably heard this before and you find a watch in the sand. Would you think, huh, a watch, this must have randomly constructed itself and just appeared here for no reason at all. Would, is that what you would think? Some people think that when they look at creation. I don't know why. I think it's partly because they want to deny a creator. But if you see a watch, that watch is going to declare something. It's going to say, I have a maker, an intelligent designer who made me. But the poor watch, also someone who bought me and didn't care about me, left me behind. So that watch has a message, right? It tells you something. When you look at creation, it's a creation. It's a beautiful design by God. It's intricate. It's amazing. It's complex, yet simple and beyond our imagination. This creation, we have to say, this points back to something, to someone, to God. So creation is a mirror. Genesis 126 also speaks of God, the pinnacle of God's creation, human beings. When you look at a human being, 
in a unique way, more than anything else in all creation, you are seeing an image of God himself. Genesis 126 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over everything. So when you look at a human being, when you look at a person, you uniquely see the image of God. It's like a reflection of him in a mirror. You're seeing a reflection of yourself when you look in a mirror, but when you look at a person, you're seeing a reflection of God himself in a unique way. Isn't that interesting? We are specifically made in his image. <clears throat> and Romans 1.18 makes this very clear. All the way towards the back of the Bible. We were at the beginning, now we're towards the end. It's true all the way through Scripture. Romans 1, 18 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So the things that people can know about God is very plain. It's out there in the open, right? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has showed it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is talking about unbelieving man who sees God's creation and knows that God created it and says, no, nope, God didn't create it. Just like the person saying, I saw this watch and it must have randomly appeared for no reason at all. They look at creation and say, oh, we happened by accident over billions of years for no reason at all, just by happenstance, by chance. And they're denying the truth. And there's an interesting phrase here. It says, although they knew God. This is by implication saying that you can know God by looking at his creation, namely his divine attributes of power and his divine nature. So you can know him through your eyes, one of your five senses. You can know him by seeing his creation. You get a better idea of him. You also can know him more by smelling things in his creation, smelling complex, beautiful smells, or hearing beautiful music, or tasting delicious food that he created. All of these things are pointing back to God and help us know him better. The Fountainhead of Joy. <clears throat> this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. I, I find it very interesting. It's a little bit, a little bit complicated, so pay very close attention on this one. He says, nature is only the image. It's the mirror, right? The symbol. But it is the symbol scripture invites me to use. Sim scripture says, look at nature. It's a mirror. We are summoned to pass in through nature, beyond her, into the splendor which she fitfully reflects. Oops. And there, <clears throat> in beyond nature, we shall eat of the tree of life. At present, if we are reborn in Christ, the spirit in us lives directly on God. But the mind, and still more, the body receives life from him at a thousand removes from, through our ancestors, through our food, through the elements. Now, so what he's saying is, God is over here, and creation is separate from God. It's created by God, and it points back to God. But it's a thousand removes from him. So when we experience anything on this earth, it's a little taste, just a little taste of God. But God himself is greater, infinitely greater than his finite creation, right? 
Just like, I'm sorry, this thing does not want to stay on my ear and it's driving me crazy. I'm going to take a minute and actually just fix it so I can stop messing with it. Hopefully. Stay. Okay. Just like if you're looking in a mirror, if you're looking in a mirror and you want to touch the person in the mirror, it feels like glass, right? You don't, you don't experience much of it. But you see the person, it's a lot more real, right? The reflection of the person, the reflection, the, everything in creation is just the reflection. It's just a small taste of it. God himself is the reality that all creation is pointing to. So it's a thousand removes. The faint, far-off results of those energies which God, God's creative rapture implanted in matter when he made the worlds are what we now call physical pleasures. And even thus filtered, they are too much for our present management. So the things in this world that we experience that are from God, that are a reflection of God, are called pleasures. And he says, these pleasures in this world are too much for us to manage, even though they're a thousand removes from God. What would it be then to taste at the fountainhead, that stream of which even these lower reaches prove so intoxicating? Isn't that an interesting thought? Just think, how intoxicating are the pleasures of this world? How amazing are the good things that we, we get in this life? God is the source of all those things, and we're just tasting a little glimpse a thousand times removed from the fountain head. Yet, that I believe is what lies before us when we go to heaven. The whole man is to drink joy from the fountain of joy. As St. Augustine said, the rapture of the saved soul will flow over into the glorified body. Jared, I'm sorry, but now I got this good, but now I feel like I'm too quiet. You could turn me up now because this thing is good, but it's not going to fall off my ear. I know. But if I try to turn it back, it will fall off again. I'm sorry, guys. Pause. We'll skip that out of the video. All right. So when we're thinking about knowing God through our five senses, it's pretty amazing, right? We're getting a taste. Essentially, when we see anything or experience anything or enjoy anything on this earth, we're getting a little taste of God, and that should give us great joy and anticipation of what it will be like to see him face to face, right? It's pretty amazing to think. Our body and our senses are a gift from God that point us to God. Now, this is another quote from C.S. Lewis that really undoes a lot of the wrong thinking about Christianity sometimes. I know some muddle-headed Christians have talked as if Christianity throughout. Oh my goodness, you guys, this thing, it's falling off. It's just. Sorry, Jared. All right. I know some muddle-headed Christians have talked as if Christianity throughout thought that sex or the body or pleasure were bad in themselves, but they were wrong. Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body, the five senses, which believes that matter is good, that God himself once took on a human body, and that some kind of body is going to be given to us even in heaven and is going to be an essential part of our happiness, our beauty, and our energy. Christianity has glorified marriage more than any other religion, and nearly all the greatest love poetry in the world has been produced by Christians. If anyone says that sex in itself is bad, Christianity contradicts him at once. And so the, the pleasures, the joys, the, the beauty of this world is all a gift from God pointing back to him, and we should not be afraid of it. We should not think it bad that there are these good things that we can enjoy, but we have to enjoy it through the scripture, right? We have to apply it scripturally in our lives and be careful to manage it biblically because these things are so intoxicating that they need rules around them. So 
Food is really good. But what happens if you eat too much food? Problems, right? So you have to enjoy God's gifts that point back to him, and you can see his goodness through them. But you have to put rules around it. I want to read a poem to you guys that is really cool and it explains this. It, it captures this in a poetic form. It's called God's Grandeur by Ger- Gerard Manley Hopkins. He says, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Think of that charge, like you charge a phone or charge something up and it's just full of electricity ready to zap something. The world is charged up with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. So though it's charged, it's just God's creation. One day it's going to flame out. One day it's going to be gone. But it gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Now that's a phrase, wreck his rod means, why did they not pay attention to his justice? They see his creation. Why did they deny and want to deny his existence, as Romans 1.18 says. That's his question. And he says, Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. So here he's talking about how creation has been abused by mankind for millennia, right? We trod and trod, smeared and bleared, smudged with our toil and our smell, and we cut down trees, and we do all this stuff to creation, yet it's still God's beautiful creation because it's charged with his grandeur. So he says, and for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. You can go out any morning and see this beautiful dew on the grass and the sun rising or at sunset and see God's creation. And it's always something that's breathtaking, right? You can go look at a flower. You can look at a landscape. You can look at a lake or a stream. And though the last lights of the black west went, O morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Here he's talking about at the end of the day when the sun is setting, Somewhere else, the sun is rising. It's springing. And why is that? Why does creation keep going? Why does it keep declaring him? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breasts and with, ah, bright wings. God continually charges his creation with his grandeur. And it continually points back to him. And so as we enjoy his creation, every part of it, every good gift that comes from him, it points us back to him and it's all charged with him. And so we can experience God in all the things that he has given us in creation. Now, scripture clarifies the meaning of history and our experiences. And I want to give you a few examples of how scripture teaches us to understand God's creation. The scripture, the scripture teaches us the meaning of Christ's death and resurrection. If we didn't have the scripture to explain it to us, it would be similar to saying, uh, on this date, George Washington crossed the Delaware River and, and fought in the Revolutionary War. We say, oh, that's great, but what does it mean, right? On this date, Jesus died on a cross. Three days later, he rose again. What does that mean? The Bible says in John three sixteen that God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so scripture teaches us that the death and resurrection of Christ is the way that God saves us. And so scripture clarifies history and it clarifies our experiences. Communion, you guys take, have taken communion on a Sunday morning. Communion teaches us to taste and see that God is good. 1 Corinthians ten twenty. talks about how we participate with the Lord himself when we eat the bread and when we drink the cup. It's an implication of the text. It's kind of a strange verse because he's talking about having communion or participation with demons. But he's saying he's contrasting it to participation with God through communion. 
Verse 20 says, No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. He wants us to be participants with Christ through the Lord's Supper. So we participate in that, and that the taste that we taste it, that is a taste of God. And it points to something greater, right? It's not just the bread. It's not just the wine or the, the juice. It is God himself that we are eating. Marriage and sex within marriage, which is one of the pleasures God has given us that he put a lot of boundaries on. He said, inside marriage only. This points to Christ's love for the church and the spiritual unity, intimacy, and joy we have in our relationship with God. Ephesians 5.22 says that marriage is a mystery and it refers to Christ and the church. And Isaiah 62 verse 5 speaks of this. I can find it. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So he's referring to marriage and the joy that a, that a husband has over his new wife is the same joy that God has in us and the same love that he has for us. But it's not a physical relationship, right? Marriage is a physical relationship, but God is spirit. And so this is just a mirror. It's a reflection that teaches us a glimpse of what it's like, but it's actually greater and better and beyond anything that we can imagine. The relationship that we have with God, the unity that we have with him, the intimacy that we will have and that we can have with him even now. Our parent-child relationships teach us about the love, care, protection, provision, and comfort that we have from God. Psalm 103. Verse 8 <clears throat> says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. And so our relationship with our parents, or when you're a parent, can give you an insight into God's love and care for you. Isn't that interesting? And so all of these things help us understand God more. And here's another one. When you think about earthquakes or storms or weather events, what do these display? They display his power and his majesty and his justice. Psalm 104 verse 32 says, who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? God. When you see a volcano, that is a display of God's power. He touched that volcano and it blew up. He looks at the earth and it trembles. That is his power. And so his power is displayed. It's reflected in all of creation. So scripture clarifies the meaning of history and our experiences. And these are just a taste. Glimpses of heaven. All the joys and pleasures of this life are but a glimpse of heaven. Just a little taste from the fountain. Just imagine what it will be like to meet the source. The Bible says that God's beauty and holiness are so vast beyond our imagination that just seeing him once will change us for eternity. 1 John 3, 2 says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. 
Can you guys imagine life without sin? Can you even imagine what it will be like? Can you imagine going a day without sinning against God or thinking a bad thought or being fully devoted to God? It's really hard to imagine, right? It's actually impossible to imagine. We cannot imagine it. It's beyond our imagination. But this verse says here that when we simply see him with our eyes, just seeing him will change us forever to the point where we won't ever want to sin again. Can you imagine that? Just seeing him once will do that to us. So imagine what it's going to be like living with him for eternity. It's going to be amazing. He is so beyond what we can imagine. And all of the joys in this life and all the pleasures and all the goodness point us to him. And so we can experience God and his goodness every day as we sit, we, we enjoy all the things that he's given us. And I'll get to that making it practical. But I want to say a warning. Don't confuse the gift with the giver. C.S. Lewis again says this, If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the, war, the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition with infinite joy when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And so when we say, you know what? I'm just happy with this life and I don't want to go to the next one. I just want all the pleasures I can get out of this life and I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm just going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore God's word. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to just have, you know, drink as much as I want, sleep with as many people as I can, do whatever I can to get pleasure. You only live once. That might be joyful for a little while, but you're, what you're doing is you're trading mud pies for a holiday at the sea. You're trading a broken cistern for the fountain of living waters, right? So don't be pleased with these things. Don't, don't, don't confuse the gift with the giver. The gifts are good, but they point us back to the giver. And the gifts need to be used properly and biblically, not selfishly. John 6, 15, and I, and I won't read the whole story, but you guys know the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then they all want to make him king. Why do they want to make him king? Because they say, this guy can make bread and fish multiply. He'll feed us, right? They're thinking earthly. And so Jesus is like, I got to get out of here. He leaves, goes across. They follow him around and they're like, hey, make more food for us. And he says, you follow me because I made you food. But what you don't realize is I have something greater than food. I have something greater than the gift. I have myself. You can have me. And he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And this is spiritually speaking, right? It's not about the food. It's not about the things of this earth. It's about feasting on God and himself in a spiritual sense. Feasting on him. He is the thing that we want most. He's the thing that can satisfy the deepest longings and desires of our heart more than anything else in all creation. So let's make it practical. When you enjoy a good meal or a treat or a drink, what should you do? Thank God for it. But don't stop there. Let the goodness of your food point you to the goodness of God and realize that he is more delicious than anything the world has to offer, right? Jeremiah 2.13 says the, the broken cistern, right? The food is just a cistern, a broken cistern that cannot fully satisfy. God is the source of that joy. Psalm 34, let's look at that one really quick. Psalm 34.8. says, O taste and see, the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that he is good. And then Psalm 107, verse 8. Psalm 
Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. He satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. So God is, we're not going to eat God, right? That's not what I'm saying. We're not going to, the physical eating is a reflection of the spiritual eating. He will satisfy our hungry soul spiritually. And this is something that's hard for us to understand because we're physical. and We don't understand our soul very well. We'll get it better when we get to heaven. But when you enjoy a good meal, when you enjoy a good drink, realize that this is just a taste of the goodness of God. When you see a beautiful sunset or a landscape or even a beautiful person because they're made in the image of God, thank God for that beauty. But don't stop there. Let the beauty of God's creation point you to the beauty of God, which is more breathtaking and intoxicating than we can begin to imagine. Have you guys ever been to the mountains and you're just looking at the mountains and you just, you look over here and you're just like, oh man. Then you just look over here and then you're looking over here and you're just, it's just breathtaking and you just got to keep looking and you just look, you can look for hours because it's so breathtakingly beautiful. That's what God is like. Psalm 27, verse 4. If I can get there. Lots of verses tonight. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. What will it be like to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord? The beauty that is so infinitely beyond what we can imagine that it will change us immediately when we see it. So enjoy his creation, thank him for it, but let it point you to God and his beauty. And then when you discover a heart-changing truth, when you learn truth about God, thank God that he revealed it to you, but don't stop there. Let that truth lead you to worship the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. All truth comes from God and truth points us to God. What about pain and suffering? So this is a question that, right, I'm talking about all the good things in the world. But what about the bad things? Can we learn about God from those two? We actually can. Pain, suffering, and death are a result of sin. They also point us to God, but in a different way. Rather than being a reflection, they are a contrast. Like night and day, good and evil show us the opposite end of the spectrum. Romans 8, 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. But here he compares it. And he says the comparison is so vast, it's not even worth comparing. You can't, it's, there's, the sufferings are nothing, insignificant, meaningless, compared to the glory that we will receive. And so our sufferings, show us a contrast so the greater the suffering you see the greater the glory of god but the suffering is nothing in comparison to the greatness of god yet god himself is not immune to pain suffering or death he experienced each of these when he became a man like us he suffered in our place so we don't have to Furthermore, he gives us meaning to our suffering by using it to conform us into his image and prepare us for an eternal weight of glory. And so God uses our suffering so that we can become more like him. When you suffer then, thank God for it. But don't stop there. Use your pain to point you to Christ and think about his great love for you. Think about the pain he experienced on the cross and the wrath of God and the suffering he went through for your sake. Whenever you stub your toe, right? Or hit your head on something, or if you get sick or have a disease, be like, this is nothing compared to what I will experience in heaven. And what was it like for Jesus to be on the cross? What was that pain? What was that suffering that he experienced? When he experienced 
the wrath of God for my sin, it was nothing compared to what I'm experiencing right now when I stub my toe, right? So pain and suffering can point us back to God and teach us more about what Christ went through and help us become like Christ. And we can grow from it. James actually says this, James chapter 1. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so when you experience suffering and trials of various kinds, count it joy, because it will make you grow more into the image of Christ. So I want to go back to our thesis and just summarize what we've talked about and what we've learned. All creation is a mirror that reflects God's glory. Therefore, all things that we experience in creation either directly or indirectly point us to God. As the creator, God is the source of beauty, comfort, pleasure, goodness, truth, and even trials. Each of these gives us glimpses into the character of God, glimpses into heaven itself. But we must look at our experiences through the lens of Scripture. For through them, we come to know God more fully, not just with our minds, but with our five senses. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this time that we can talk about what it means to know you, to know you in our bodies and through your creation, through our five senses. Lord, help us to experience you in a new way because of what we've learned here tonight. Experience your goodness, experience your joy, experience your pleasure, experience your beauty in all of your creation, and let it lead us to worship and rejoicing and seeking after you with all our heart. Lord, the things that we have in this life are nothing compared to knowing you and to being with you, Lord. So give us a deep thirst and longing to be with you. And Lord, we pray that you would return soon so that we can be with you forever in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.